the transfiguration in one hour, and then we will do Jesus in the following two hours. But it's still about Jesus here and there. But for the transfiguration, please, I, I need all your concentration with me. So try to get rid of anything that is bothering you. Uh, and just focus, because this, this topic is absolutely um, beautiful, deep, and central in uh, our faith. Um, and if you have your Bible with you, please start by opening uh, your Bible at chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter, chapter 17. We have the Transfiguration in other Gospels as well. Mark and you. Uh, you have the apparition of uh, 
Moses, we just mentioned Moses earlier on, and Elijah, they are speaking with Jesus. Then the a cloud, sign of a stronger, clearer presence of God, arrives, overshadows everybody, and then they fall. Who remains, remains Jesus only, and that's it. So for the Western tradition, there is an objective change, physical change in Jesus. As you can read it, and he was, uh, verse number 2, 17 two, he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Okay? So for the uh, tradition, the Western tradition, it's clear objectively there is a change in Jesus. Now, for the Eastern tradition, it's not the case. The change for the Greek father, fathers is happening in the apostles, not in Jesus. In the sense that their capacity of seeing deeply, contemplating Jesus, who is Jesus, this capacity is transfigured, is changed. So for the Greek fathers, the fact that Jesus is taking with him the three, he's elevating them, and it's the same word we use in this text that we use in the Mass by saying, by mentioning the elevation, anaphora. The prayer, the Eucharistic prayer is called anaphora. And the verb used in Greek for this text, when Jesus takes with him the three apostles, is anaphora. He takes them with him. So it's the same, it's the same verb, an elevation. So for the Greek fathers, this, the change occurs in the apostles. There is a purification, there is a transformation that will allow them to see Jesus, but Jesus as he is. And then, will, after centuries and centuries, you will uh, find that in the Eastern Church, a big discussion will, uh, will happen, which is, what did they actually see? Did they see the very nature of God in Jesus or did they see just a created light? So the discussion will be, is it a created or uncreated light that they will see? Are you with me? And then you will have a big discussion, very strong arguments will happen in the 15th century in Eastern Church, we are then separated because the Eastern and the West, the East and the West separate in the year 1064, if I'm not wrong, 1064. So what happens at that moment is a, it's a local thing, not, not uh, something that touches us, but it's very interesting, theologically very interesting for us. Okay? Now, let us go through the text. If you, if you wish, if you will. So, I will read. Now, I'm reading from Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 17. And I will just start from where it starts, which is not really chapter 17, it's one verse before, one verse before, so 1628, it says, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Six 
Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So, when we read the text of the Transfiguration, we cannot start it at 17.1, which is six days later. We have to understand that six days later comes after just the verse before. And what do we have in this verse? Jesus is speaking. He says, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So, what is he saying? Yeah, and this is what? It's called what? It's a statement, but what type of statement? It is something that... Prophetic. Yeah, well, as well. It's simply, what, uh, what did we say? Hope is what? Is attached to what? Hope? Promise. Do you remember? Promise. Promise. Excellent. Faith is eyes opened, hope hands opened to receive a promise. So here he is delivering a promise. He's, he's giving you something. No. In your life as Christian, when you read this verse, you may stop and say, well, I feel this verse is hitting me. This verse speaks to me. This verse is a promise given to me. You may say, no, because this is like not for me. It says some and I'm not amongst this some. You might say, no, I am among this some. Why not? And I want to see. It's up to you. To God, but God is giving it. So up to you. We will see that later. Who and why and why three and not more and what did John do in his own gospel. I will mention it in the end, so if I forget, please remind me. Six days later, after this promise, he promised that they will see. You see in the text before, you will not taste that before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So when you read it, you say, well, this is the kingdom. The kingdom is something very far. We always, we always think about after death. We're not really interested about this life. So when you say the kingdom is like, send it away. No. Kingdom is now. Jesus says the kingdom is happening now. Okay? So, six days later, after this promise, the promise will be fulfilled. The promise is fulfilled. This is why the text of the Transfiguration is central for the Eastern Churches, especially the Greek Church, the Byzantine. For them, the Transfiguration encapsulates all spiritual life, all prayer life. If you want to learn about prayer, you need to enter in the mystery of Transfiguration. So it's not just one thing, one event, one moment in Jesus' life amongst others for the, 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 Byzantine, the Byzantine church. And this is theology, and what interests us is theology. We don't care if it's Eastern or Western. What interests us is what people understood from Jesus, what people understood from the Gospel, how they lived it for centuries. So if they say, and this is what happened to me years ago when I discovered it, I was, I was shocked. I am trained Western theology. And when I discovered one day reading a book written by uh, a Catholic Byzantine priest, there are very few in the world, but they exist, Catholic Byzantine, so Catholic, but from the Eastern right, Byzantine right. Uh, he was at that time, I think, living in Paris, and he wrote that book in French, uh, The Transfiguration According to the Greek Fathers. If you're interested, I can send it to you by mail. I have it in French, I don't have to. I don't, I don't think it exists in English, but who knows. So uh, I was struck. I said, how can, can, how can they say that transfiguration is central to the point that it encapsulates all prayer life? I'm very interested by prayer life, so if another Christian says to me, this is central for me, well, I should open my ears and my heart and my, my eyes in order to try to understand. And then when you enter and you dive in that world of the Transfiguration, you discover not a day after day, but year after year, that it's really central in our Christian faith.
the point that, for me, it's part of the course. Of course, everything is part of the course. All the gospel is part of the course, but sometimes you have to stop on the central things. And since we are teaching uh, the prayer life, spiritual life, you cannot avoid uh, uh, transfiguration. Okay? So it's about seeing. And spiritual life is as well about seeing, contemplating. We forgot completely this notion today in the church. It's very rare when you hear about contemplation. Very rare you hear about <coughs> seeing. While this is central for all our tradition. If you open the <coughs> French Dictionnaire de Spiritualité, which is a, a, a big <coughs> dictionary that started in 1932-33, and ended, completion of that dictionary ended 1995. <coughs> 1995. So from 32 to 95, <coughs> there is a, a, a different team's work on this uh, dictionary, on spiritual life. Only spiritual life. We are not talking theology. We are talking a little part of theology. <coughs> and when you open it under the, the, the word contemplation, how many pages would you find? Endless. <coughs> hundreds, not tens, hundreds of pages just on contemplation. Contemplation in the, in the, in the philosophers first, because before speaking about faith, we, we need to see what happened before. So we have the philosophers, not the recent one, the, the Greek ones. And then you have contemplation. Contemplation, and you take all, almost author by author, no? Origin, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, Dionysus, and then you reach uh, closer from, from us. I mean, closer is 10 centuries, no? like St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, etc. And then you learn about contemplation and how contemplation was absolutely central. Today, seeing, what is seeing? Nothing. You see? So it is, it is very important to come back to our roots. When he says, you will see, this may change entirely your life. Because if you are promised to see something here on earth, from Jesus, in Jesus, I bet you would leave everything for that. So, but the point is that we don't offer that anymore. It's not in the market. It's not anymore more in the Christian market. Well, you have something to see. But this is the real Christian tradition. Contemplation is central for us as Christians. I do not care if the actual books and actual speech doesn't speak about contemplation, but contemplation is central and should be central for each one of us. Otherwise, you didn't learn anything in this course. Okay? So when the text says there are, there are some standing here, and this text may apply today, there are some sitting instead of standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom, well, that, that should mean a lot. This is why the discussion great argument, fight, that happened in the 15th century in the Greek Orthodox Church uh, between two opinions uh, is, is central. The two opinions is, did they see the uncreated light, God himself, or did they see just some created light? This discussion is central. Let me get it closer to you, so you will grasp it more. Why am I addressing these things? I, I remember uh, a few Saturdays ago, I said that after communion, again, in the Byzantine rite, Catholic, because there are Catholic Byzantine, so don't worry, it's not. I'm not leading you astray away from the, from the church, okay? So, after communion, what do they what do they do they sing? You remember that? I did mention it. It's not something new, right? Huh? 
Yeah, yeah. We have seen, we have seen the true light. So all the people after communion, systematically, each each uh, Sunday, except some Sundays of, of Easter, we say something different, which is uh, he's risen, etc. But the usual daily life, daily Sundays, daily, normal Sunday, people think we saw the true light. So when you receive communion, there is a direct contact between you and Jesus. Where this contact is happening? I'm doing a little bit of revision of what we saw before. Where is it happening in us? Who said spirit? Yes, in the spirit. What is this? God. God. Who is it? God. Okay. What is this? The squash potato? What is this? Ah. When you receive communion, there is a contact that happens here between the Spirit and God. The Spirit is the part in us. It's, I would say, it's nature, it's fabric. It's, it's capable of entering in direct contact with God. And the Spirit is above or below the clouds. Clouds allude to what? Below the clouds, what do you have? And above the clouds, what do you have? What's the difference? Why, why uh, did I use the word cloud? I can use anything. I, mean, uh, I, I use it. Huh? No, 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 no. We have the soul and the body. What, what, is, what is happening below the, the, the clouds? Yeah, so how would you say it in one word, English word? Consciousness. Consciousness, awareness, perception. Consciousness, perception, awareness. If God speaks to you in the Lectio Divina, you understand. It's not, maybe he spoke to me, maybe not. So this is not Lectio Divina. This is, Jesus didn't speak. Jesus, Jesus just appeared and went. So you are aware. And now I am speaking to you, hopefully at least you hear my voice. I'm not, I'm not going further, but at least you hear my voice. So this is what? This is awareness. When you wake up, you are aware. Which part in you is aware? Is body and soul. When you receive communion, you receive the very nature of God as well. His body, his soul, his spirit, and his divinity. Body, soul, and spirit is his human nature. Jesus' human nature. Then, spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Spirit, uh, the, the top of, the eye of, of his soul, of Jesus' soul. Then you have his, his, his divine nature. So when you receive his divine nature, did you enter in direct contact with his divine nature, yes or no? We already addressed that. We are losing time. Do you feel it? No. Do you feel it? No. Which part of you feels? The soul and the body. The soul. The body and the soul feel. The spirit feels? But it has a direct contact. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So this is why we say there is a there is a real contact between us and God. We are fed really, truly. We don't sense it directly. We may sense some crumbs that fall from the table 
here. But these crumbs are what? These crumbs are created. While here, it's the uncreated God.
branch branch and the prophetical branch, which is the monastic branch, or any spiritual branch, which is the other, the other branch. So you recruit the bishop from people who have this experience. Okay? Anyway. So, let us continue and read the text, if you don't mind. Six days later, Jesus took with him. You have four indications that show us that he is performing something very strong, very special, very special, very specific while taking them up into the mountain. So, taking with him, lead, let them up high the mountain by themselves. Of course, this, this is a translation. You certainly have different words, but if you really read carefully your translation, you will find that you have four descriptions of what Jesus is doing. Taking up with him, taking up with him, then leading up high mountain and by themselves, solitude, being separated. The word is separated, alone. So you have high up the mountain, separated and taking the anaphorin. This is the word we use in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the mass, like when the priest elevates at the anaphora, which is the big prayers, thank you, the big prayers that the, 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 the priest say, what we call today the Eucharistic prayer. Okay? And he was trans transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his, his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, I will come back again to Moses and Elijah. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings or tents. You know, a tent. The Boy Scouts, they have a tent. So it's a tent here. Three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. It's a translation. You certainly have different translation, different words. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down, the text doesn't finish. The text continues. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them. There's an order. Command. Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So it's about a vision. All what happens during transfiguration is a vision. They had a vision. This is why he says, tell no one about the vision. And he says, until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Why? Now you are aware that the vision is told to the entire world because it's present in the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. So it's not a secret. Everybody can read by a Bible and read it. But he asked them to wait until he dies and rises from the dead. Why? Think Greek. Don't say it's all Greek to me. <laughs> how the how the fathers the Greek fathers will, will see it just for one hour we can be Greek for an hour so that you can reveal what they are seeing in the future after its uh, resurrection then we can fathers will be here that uh, 
Jesus has freely for us to stay to have So you, you want to say that transfiguration is is something about the resurrection? Um, no, yes, yes. Or, be, or maybe because he promised in the transfiguration that he will rise, but he promised elsewhere as well. So why they shouldn't mention the transfiguration before the resurrection? What will happen in the resurrection? We know it, we addressed it. What Jesus does on the cross, we saw. We remember. Everything is given in, in, in the cross. Death and, re and resurrection, of course. I don't say the cross without saying the resurrection. It, it goes together, obviously. So, he transforms us. He, is, he, he changes us. He makes us capable of being really, uh, of, of seeing uh, God, of he, he, what happens from Jesus' side to the squashed potato? On the cross, from his side, not from our side, from his side, what does he do? You remember, the three levels of the cross, the three depths of the cross. The first is his body suffering. The second, his soul is suffering and bringing us toward uh, him, toward his divinity. And the place where he is bringing us, the third layer, is this connection in his spirit and divinity, because they are they are together, they are united. At this level, we are united to him. So our body, by his body, is purified and transformed. Our body and senses and everything. Our soul is led by his soul and purified and brought back to communion with God. And our spirit, this is my question, our spirit, the squash potato, is transformed, purified, transformed, receives the beauty of God again, and then is with God. So, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the whole work of God from his side. Now, from our side, it starts in our life how to receive all what he, he realized for us. This is our, our business now, our work, to receive what he did. But we need to acknowledge what he already realized. Uh, we, 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 we sum it up too rapidly when he said he saved us. What does it mean he saved us? You have to stop. And you have to stop everybody. When any person, any friend says to you when he saved us, well, stop him. What does it mean saved us? It means anything, nothing. It can be anything or nothing. Saved us means my body has been transformed, purified, and brought back to the original working of it. The soul the same and the spirit the same. All this he did it from his side. It doesn't appear yet on me because my body is still far from God. My soul is still very far from God. My spirit is even farther away from God. But he did it. So I'm just receiving what he did. You see what I mean? Do you understand? It's not just he saved me, it's he saved me, he did everything, but now I start, I'm starting to receive the transformation. You remember the four dogmas in which we believe. The first one is the Trinity. The second, the second one is the Incarnation. The third one is you sleep. Four dogmas, remember. Forget when you have a... When you forget everything, just remember these four things. When everything is wiped from your mind, at least keep these four things. First one is Trinity. Second one is Incarnation. Third one is... Hmm. Redemption. The cross. Salvation. Redemption. The fourth one is what? Exactly. Ah, thank God. Yeah, you, you remember at least the fourth one. Lovely. I, 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 I appreciate that. So the fourth one is sanctification. We hardly mention it as well. Why? It is central. Because if you do not believe in, in the sanctification, then we, we are lost. He did everything, but we didn't get anything. Sanctification means God is capable of changing us. We believe in that as Catholics. There are people who are Christians who do not believe in that. Trust me. I can prove it. Yeah, there are people who believe that just Jesus covers us with his blood and Bob's your uncle. 
And this is catastrophic because the human being in their belief cannot change. I believe that the human being can change. The human being can change. We won't change his character. We won't change his nature. He will still have 24 hours to live every day. But the behavior can change. The senses can change. The, the soul can change. Absolutely. Otherwise, why are we here? If the human being cannot change, this course doesn't have any meaning at all. Throw it in the bin. You understand? You cannot be Catholic without believing the fourth dogma. It's not revealed as a dogma, it's not said as a dogma, but it is our faith, it is a core thing, four core things, trinity, incarnation, redemption, and sanctification. It's not declared as a dogma, there is no Pope who came and said we have to believe in the dogma as a fourth dogma, in the sanctification as a fourth dogma, he didn't say it, but it is our daily life. The Pope doesn't have to say everything, because it's so obvious. Okay? Clear? So sanctification is the transformation of us. So transfiguration is our is our trans transfiguration is our transformation for the Greeks. Okay? So now, why Jesus says, do not reveal that before my resurrection? Because people cannot see me if they are not purified. As simple as that. And where will everybody be purified? On the cross. In his passion and cross, crucifixion, death and resurrection. This is where we are all purified, transformed and changed. So, I cannot see God if I'm not changed, if I'm not transformed. My eyes are covered with various layers so I cannot see him. And my desire, my earnest desire is to see Jesus. His, his uh, divinity. When you read St. John of the Cross, now you mentioned me, you didn't find the spiritual canticle. The spiritual canticle is a book written by St. John of the Cross. St. John of the Cross is a Spanish mystic. He is born in uh, 1545 and died in uh, 1591. Spanish mystic, spiritual man, come alive. He wrote a book, many books, four, book, four main books. One of these books, called Spiritual Canticle, describes, I mentioned this book earlier, a um, few Saturdays ago, first Saturday, actually. He describes the growth of the human being, the transformation, this famous false dogma that we don't mention, but is absolutely the core of our life. He describes the change in the human being. So you can watch, but in a very lovely way, because it's a poem, and it's each stanza, 40 stanza, and each stanza is commented shortly. In the, in the first, 11 first stanza, you know what the soul is asking God to, to give? What, what does she want from, from God, the soul? You know, there, these are the strongest moments of purification are in the 11, 13 first stanzas of the spiritual canticle. Then he goes after in and spiritual marriage, etc. What, what the soul is seeking? All our desires. All our desires? To be purified. To be purified and do it positive. Union. Union. Union, yeah, say it in another word. Holiness. Holiness, yes, say it in another word. We, we, we just, huh? Something. To see, to see the divinity of Jesus. The soul goes, is tortured because the soul wants to see the divinity of Jesus. He said, no, I don't want any more any messenger. Nature speaks about God. She sees that the spouse is sending her like bouquets of flowers to her. When she sees trees and flowers, says, this is Jesus offering me these things. Yes, okay, but where is he? And then he sends me angels, and then he sends me messengers, and then he sends me uh, understandings, and this and that. But all this is not him. So she said, I want him. Don't send me anymore any messengers. I want you. You see? And the desire grows and grows and grows until we reach what? She sees him. She has a vision. And it is considered by St. John of the Cross the end of the purification and the beginning of the spiritual engagement like the betrothal no betrothal is engagement yeah. 
spiritual betrothal. Then you'll have other things that will come after. But she has a very strong uh, vision at that moment. Not a vision of physical Jesus. Seeing physical Jesus is not a vision. Ah, I saw Jesus. Well, fair enough, good. The, the uh, Pharisees did see Jesus, yes or no? Yes. So, please, be reasonable. When you say, I saw Jesus, be aware that you can see him in different layers. The Pharisees did see Jesus, yes or no? Yes. So, when you hear about visions, be very careful. Doesn't mean anything. Did you see his divinity? Ah, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. We go deeper. And this is a deeper understanding of the gospel. The gospel is structured. How the gospel is structured? The gospel is structured this way. You see this arrow? We want to reach the divinity, Jesus' divinity. We want to reach his death. When you read St. Mark's Gospel or St. John's Gospel, he is leading you toward a final moment that is central for him. And this moment is about seeing the divinity of Jesus. This moment, for instance, in St. Mark, is a centurion, is a, you know, soldier who says it. He says, that man was really the son of God. Who cares who said it? For, for Mark, this is my goal. I want to bring you to that point that you saw Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Mary and Joseph. Well, maybe people thought that. So you go and, and then you see signs, you see miracles, then you wonder who is who who is, who is him, etc, 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 and then you go through his passion, and then you enter in his death. So the gospel is not telling the story of Jesus. It's historical, but it's not telling the story of Jesus. It is educating us, leading us towards the union with Jesus. St. John, in his gospel, what is his final point? Our final two points. Doing the same. What? The, 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 in St. Mark is the centurion. The centurion says, yes, truly, he is God. He is son of God. So you, reader of St. Mark, you, follower of the catechesis of St. Mark, you reach a point where you will say, you will shout loudly inside of you with the centurion and say, well, he is truly the Son of God. Not just we believe that Jesus is Son of God. Do you see the difference? We all say we believe that Jesus is God. But do you see that he is God? This is another thing. And what matters is not only to believe, but to see. Okay? So, what St. John said? You know it. Is leading me toward one point at least, or two points, if you give me one or more the answers. Mm. It's so it's obviously toward the end of the gospel. Hmm? Average so that you believe. Yeah, you have this. I wrote that uh, so you can believe. This is the first conclusion of, of St. John, um, chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. St. John, St. John's Gospel is 21 chapters, first conclusion is chapter 20, and in the end of chapter 20 he says, I wrote all these signs so you can believe, but belief on St. John is the vision we are speaking about, and we will see it now. So, yes, but what happens? St. John wants us to reach a point and to be like whom? And do what? And feel what? The elevation. Elevation. No, no. I, I, something from St. John's Gospel. An event in St. John's Gospel. Two things that happen in St. John's Gospel. You know, the first thing. Next to whatever. The one was with God. No, 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 no. Toward the end of the Gospel, we are led to two things. You can open the Gospel if you want and, and, and try to see chapter 19, 20, something.
What does Thomas do? No, after he does, what does he say? My Lord and my God. This is the realization of the whole Gospel of St. John. He wants you to be touched by St. John's Gospel. He wants you to be touched by Jesus' divinity. And with Thomas, say, this is in chapter 20, if you are trying to find it, chapter 20, verse, I don't know, 18 or something. Okay? 28. 28, okay. So, in, in, in chapter 20, verse 28, this is where John wants you to go. It's not about believing or not believing or this or that. John wants us to enter in the side of Jesus <coughs> that was opened on the cross. Then when you enter inside, you are reached by Jesus. Notice I didn't say you reach Jesus. You are reached by <coughs> Jesus comes to you. Jesus reveals himself to you. And therefore you say, my God. This means that you do not believe that Jesus is God. You know that Jesus is God. You have the experience that Jesus is God. As St. Augustine says, you, Thomas put his finger in, his, in Jesus' side, or his hand in Jesus' side, but it's Jesus himself who revealed himself and his divinity to Thomas. He touched with his body Jesus' body, but it's Jesus' divinity who revealed itself to Thomas' spirit. That's all. Are you with me? So when St. John writes his gospel, he wants us to reach that point. So it's not a point of believing in our sense, which means being blind. Today, when you say you believe, you imply that you don't see. While all the believing, according to St. John, is about seeing. So when he, say, when he says, I wrote all this in order for you to believe, it means to be united. It, mean, it means to see. It doesn't mean our understanding of to believe. You need to be very careful not to project our understanding our, or our um, use of the word, or the verb to believe on the gospel. You need, we need to respect the gospel as it is and not modify it and project consciously or unconsciously our understanding of various words or concepts on the gospel. If you read carefully St. John, he, the, word, the verb believe in uh, verse 20. 31, which is chapter 20, verse 21, I wrote all this, all these signs for you in order for you to believe that Jesus, this man, is the Son of God or is God. So I want you to go from his body to his divinity through his passing through his soul. Jesus is a way. And the way is in him, it's not outside of him. So we go from his body to his soul, we are like St. Saint, Saint Catherine of Siena. She says that I'm going from his, uh, his feet, his knees, uh, his uh, waist, and then until I want to reach his side. So beautiful. But see it as well from his body to his soul to his spirit. Like I say, I showed at the cross. You know, it's a, Entering deeper and deeper. Okay? So, let me now uh, uh, wrap up this. Of course, there is much more, much, much more in the Transfiguration. I already touched just one little thing about it. I cannot say everything because I would, I would, I would need much more hours. I recommend you to go on the blog, on the website of the School of Mary, uh, amovinci.com. 
first page you have a blog, you have a link for a blog. You click on that link, you are sent to a blog. And in the blog, you can put transfiguration up on the right, keyword, the word you are searching is transfiguration. Then you will have few links that will open in the blog, subjects. You will find transfiguration 1, 2, 3, and 4. Please do read that, because I go deeper and deeper in the issue. I want just to say one thing, wrapping it up. The transfiguration has two moments. The first moment is <clears throat> the first moment is what? When Jesus um, clothes and face are transfigured and he is with he appears to be with most uh, Moses and Elijah appear to him and they speak. And the version in St. Luke says that they speak about his Exodus. The Exodus, which is transit and movement from death to, to life, from taking us from where we are to where he is. This Exodus, uh, Elijah and Moses and Elijah are speaking to Jesus about his Exodus. So you see how the cross is central here, it appears. This is in St. Luke's, St. Luke's version of the Transfiguration. So this is the first part. Then the second part, then Peter in the middle says his words. Now let us uh, do three tests for you, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. The second part is the overshadowing of the uh, cloud, the, 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 the luminous cloud. Okay? The first part has Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Second part is the cloud and the voice of the Father. In the first part we have Moses, Moses, Elijah and Jesus. In the early generation, the early, the early life of the, the, the church, the apostles took the liturgy of the synagogue, the Sabbath. When you go to a synagogue and it's Sabbath, at Jesus' time, before Jesus' time or now, you have readings. You can check online, you can check the liturgical Jewish calendar. Liturgical Jewish calendar, go to it on the wiki, you will see that they divide till now and it is conformed to how it was at Jesus' time. There are two traditions that divide the whole uh, Pentateuch, which is the uh, Torah. The Torah is the first five books of uh, the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and uh, the, the, the Deuteronomy. So this is Moses. These are uh, understood to be by the Jewish and by law tradition, uh, our, our, our Christian tradition to be written by Moses or his words collected from Moses. And then Elijah, and they read one reading from the Torah, the Torah being these first five books, Moses, and one passage from uh, the prophets till now. And the division can be either uh, all the Torah and the main prophets are divided and spread all over one year or all over three years. Depends on two traditions. One is a Palestinian tradition and one is an uh, exile tradition when they went to the actual Iraq uh, for being in exile. They had a different tradition of uh, liturgical tradition. So as we have readings in the Mass, the Jewish have readings in the Sabbath, the same. And this is our tradition comes from their tradition, because the apostles, the first thing they did, they took the Jewish tradition, but added to it Jesus, uh, the gospel. It wasn't yet written in the first generation, but already various accounts, already first uh, catechesis was already present from day one. So, as we have our early tradition of readings is one book of 
Mos one passage from Moses read in the church in Sunday, one passage read from the prophets, and then something from the gospel and from uh, one of the letters in, in the New Testament. So, the early tradition had how many readings? Except, and apart from the Psalm, how many now did I mention? No, exclude the, the Psalm. No, 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 you have one letter from the New Testament and the Gospel. <coughs> so you have? No, 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 you have Moses, one, Elijah, the prophets, two, Jesus, uh, the letter, three, and Jesus, four. So they have four. Again, Moses, like the Jews. Prophet like the Jews. Then what is what belongs to us is one letter, one passage from the letter of the New Testament, and then the gospel. Are you with me? Are you with me? <clears throat> that was the early tradition. Then we we uh, slowly lost, unfortunately, the readings from the Old Testament. We reach even a point in certain churches that we don't have even any reading from the Old Testament, which is wrong. But remember that we have that, that, that effect. Moses, Elijah, a, something, a, a book from Moses, a passage from Moses, a passage from a prophet, and then the Gospel of Jesus. The Transfiguration is telling us something very important about the Mass, but in a very subtle way. You read Moses, you read the prophets, and you will have Jesus, the gospel. They all speak about one thing. They don't speak about various things. They all focus on the, his exodus, according to St. Luke's version of the Transfiguration. Our temptation is to divide, I th and think these are three different readings. Three different tents, like Peter, what Peter would say. Why we have only one tent? Who is our tent? Jesus, Jesus is our tent. When uh, you have the uh, verse 14 in, uh, in John, he says, and uh, the verb became, that the word became flesh. And, say again. Pitched his tent amongst us. Pitched his tent amongst us. Pitched his tent amongst us. His tent. We are all invited to enter in Jesus' tent because he is our tent. This is why, chapter 2, St. John, when he uh, casts cast away the, the vendors, what does he say? Destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And then John adds, he was talking about the temple of his body. The tent. The body is a tent. So we are all invited to enter in this tent. So when Peter says, let us build three tents, he's wrong. It's an offense. There is only one tent. When you read the end of the text of Matthew, what do you find? The text of the transfiguration. Do you see it? Verse, verse 8, what do you read? Hmm? They only saw Jesus. Only Jesus was there. So not three tents, Peter. Only one tent. And I didn't have tents with them. I don't know. It's just, it's just, you know, you, you don't climb, you don't climb. Uh, in four people having three tents. So they didn't have tents with them. It's, it's complete uh, nonsense if we take it only literally. It's, it's full of meaning, the transfiguration. You can spend your entire life just on this text. Trust me. There is enough food for you. For you. Okay? So it's not three tents. It's, but it's very interesting because this speaks, it's for us. It's not when you go to church and you listen to the first three Moses. And you listen to the second reading, one of the books of the prophets. And then you have Jesus, the gospel. One of 
the fathers of the church says, we hope that your eyes will be transfigured and that you will see that Jesus only in the three texts. So you have every Sunday a great opportunity to live the transformation. The first part of the transfiguration is the first part of the Mass. The second part of the transfiguration is the second part of the Mass. You will start step by step to see it. This is why the text starts saying six days after six days. And we have Sunday every six days, seventh day. Luke says the eighth day. And the eighth day in the early tradition was the day that God created for us Christians. Not the seventh, the south, but the eighth for us. So six, seventh after the sixth or eighth is, is the same in the Christian early tradition. So he's just telling us, be careful, this is the Mass. Read it, it's not mine. Read it and you will see it. It's yours, it's not mine. You see? So the first part, the temptation is to see, to hear Moses, Elijah, and not to see the text, as Origen says, the clothes. Now Jesus' clothes are transfigured. So Origen says that Jesus' clothes is the, the text of the Old Testament is the word of God for us. We didn't throw the Old Testament in the bin, sorry. God for his words. We didn't forget the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, is part of our faith. Without the Old Testament, everything falls down. Everything collapses. The Old Testament is Jesus' words, but they need to be transfigured. And we need to learn how to see them with the fathers of the church. Otherwise, we will never enter in the Old Testament. We will read it like anything, any text. Jesus reveals his fullness in the Old Testament, not only in the New Testament. The New Testament starts, the ends, you go back, but you go deeper. So, the text is the cloth, Jesus' cloth. The text is transfigured. How many times in the Old Testament Jesus is mentioned? You need to learn it from the fathers of the church. When Jeremiah is suffering, when David is suffering, St. Augustine, Augustine says, it's Jesus who is suffering, not him. You could see Jesus in this prophet. You could see Jesus in, in Moses. You could see Jesus. Our real Moses is Jesus. Our real Jeremiah is Jesus. Joshua. Uh, jo how do you call it? Joshua? Joshua, who takes them and let them enter in the, new, in, the, in, the, in the promised land. Who is our Joshua? Joshua is Jesus. It's, it's the same word in, uh, in Hebrew, no? Yeshua. Same word. So our real Joshua is Jesus. So when you reread, when you come with Jesus' light and reread, the new Old Testament is transfigured. So you don't see any more Moses and Elijah. You see only a New Testament. You will see only Jesus present. Are you with me? Okay. Now, second part of the transfiguration is the cloud, and the cloud overshadows everybody. When you receive, you receive communion, we are elevated, anaphorin, the Eucharistic prayer, lift up your hearts, we enter deeper and deeper, <coughs> then we receive various prayers and various blessings and various incensing. Incenses because we will become his body. We are his body and we will receive a greater portion of his body. This is why we are incensed in the church. You remember, sometimes the break solemnity, the break, big solemnity is when you have a vision. No? <coughs> you have, <coughs> uh, I don't know, a deacon, whoever is in, or a servant who is incensing. He senses first the priest and then he incenses us. We, we stand up and we receive this. Why this? Why are we incensed? Because we are the holy <coughs> people of God and we will receive the Holy, His body and His blood. So as the priest will prepare the offerings on the altar, we should be prepared as well to receive what He will bring. The issue here is, is Jesus. You understand? The core of the Mass is Jesus Himself. <clears throat> okay? So this is why we are incensed, because we are being prepared to receive. So the cloud comes, and overshadows us. We all, hopefully all, receive communion in the Mass. 
So we are all taken in him. So if you had real x-rays, Greek x-rays, and entered in the, in, the, in the church after communion, whom would you see? Whom would you see? Jesus only. Are you with me? Yeah. Ah, fine. Got it. Okay? You see? You understand? This is Greek x-rays. Why? Well, Holy Spirit x-rays, I prefer. <clears throat> okay? So you see that the transfiguration is telling us the Mass. So you understand why the Greeks <coughs> say, wait, the, the Greek fathers, don't, don't, don't mix everything now, go travel now with your mind in, in the islands, in the Greek islands now. No, we, we're not in the Greek islands, we are with the Greek fathers. It's a different thing. Okay? <coughs> This is why they say that the transfiguration is central. Everything is in it. Would you agree that the Mass has everything? That the Mass is everything? Yes. yes. The Mass is the source of our day and it's the, 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 the summit, the apex of our day. So you draw everything from the Mass and you bring everything to, to the Mass. From the Mass you go with the Mass, with Jesus, and to the Mass you come bringing everything, like in the off, uh, offerings, you know, the procession of, our, of the offerings. You, we bring everything. You bring your life. You bring your family. You bring your concerns, your country, your, your worries, your, your work, your, your, your whoever. You bring everything. This is your office. You have to do that. This is the pre baptismal, baptismal priesthood. We bring all that. So everything is in the Mass. And if the Transfiguration is another way to tell the Mass, we understand that that everything, that we can find everything in the Transfiguration. It tells all the story. When you enter the Mass, you have to be terrified. This is why we ask for forgiveness. In order to come closer to God, we ask for forgiveness. Then we enter, we listen to God. Moses, Elijah, Jesus, Exodus. Then we, we enter in the second part of the Mass, and then we will receive, we, will, we are elevated, we will receive the communion. We are all overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and Jesus himself. And there is only one tent, Jesus himself. So when you wake up after the Mass, you look around you, it's only Jesus. Okay? Now, we, we will stop and we will continue. We'll take five minutes break. Thank you.